This evening, it is truly an enormous honor and pleasure for us to introduce our final speaker in this year's series, Professor Janaki Bakley. Professor Bakley received her PhD from Columbia University and then held tenured positions on Columbia's faculty in the Department of Middle East and Asian Languages and Cultures and the Department of History. She also served as director of Columbia's South Asia Institute for seven years. Just this past year, um, she became an associate professor of history at the University of California at Berkeley, from where she now joins us here in Abu Dhabi. Professor Bakley is a most appropriate choice for our series because her work has been and continues to do much to revise the discipline of history and questions of space and place within it, as well as its relation to other disciplines. She is the author of several important articles and a very pioneering and important book entitled Two Men in Music, Nationalism and the Making of an Indian Classical Tradition, which was published by Oxford University Press and Permanent Black in 2005. This book, which was shortlisted for the Hitch Crossword Book Award in India and the Lionel Trilling Award at Columbia is, and I quote, a provocative account of the development of modern national culture in India by using classical music as a case study. Janaki Bakley demonstrates how the emergence of an quote unquote Indian cultural tradition reflected colonial and exclusionary practices, particularly the exclusion of Muslims by the Brahmanic elite, which occurred despite the fact that Muslims were the major practitioners of the Indian music that was installed as a Hindu national tradition. The book then lays bare how a, na a nation's imaginings from politics to culture reflect rather than transform societal divisions. Today's talk um, builds on some of these same themes and is drawn from a very exciting new book project entitled Hindu Fundamentalism and Intellectual History of Religion, Politics, and Modern India. Her talk examines the concept of global intellectual history using as a lens the case of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar and is provocatively titled, quote, Putting Global Intellectual History in Its Place. We are thrilled that she is able to come to Abu Dhabi to speak to us, and please join me in extending a very warm welcome. Good evening, and thank you, Lauren, and thank you to NYU, the Institute, and uh, the History Department for inviting me to Abu Dhabi. It certainly spurred me to write a draft of a new chapter, and um, I could not be happier to be here. In this talk, I will use India's most controversial anti-colonial nationalist, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, his dates are 1883 to 1966, to consider what the contours of a new global intellectual history might look like. Savarkar is the classic example of the early 20th century revolutionary Indian nationalist who went to London to study law, only to become seen as outside the law by the Metropolitan Police. Fairly early on, during his days in college, he came to be associated with the wing of Indian nationalism that colonial officials termed the extremists. His companions during the five years he was in London were a motley crew of like-minded revolutionary Indian students, all of whom idolized Irish nationalists, in particular the Fenians, Russian bomb makers, and Italian thinkers. Within six months of his arrival, he translated Mazzini's biography into Marathi and by the end of the year started a secret revolutionary society called the Free India Society, clearly modeled after Mazzini's Young Italy. In 1910, on the charge of waging war against the king, as well as for seditious speeches made in India four years earlier, Savarkar was arrested in London and brought back to India for trial. The notoriety surrounding his trial made him a quote-unquote terrorist of world fame, capturing the interest of the international press and figures such as Maxim Gorky. He was sentenced to two life terms in the Andaman Cellular Jail, brought back to India in 1922. He wrote an extended essay in English, not his mother tongue Marathi, but in English, entitled Essentials of Hindutva, which soon became the de facto manifesto for a right-wing extremist and militant Hindu nationalism. He was placed under house arrest until 1937, after which he became the president of the Hindu political party called the Hindu Mahasabha. His rhetoric by now, always strident, had become particularly so, denouncing the main voice of the Indian Nationalist Party, the Indian National Congress, for taking too soft a line on Muslims. As a result, he lived his entire life under surveillance, first under the British and then under Indian surveillance, not least because he was believed to have been implicated in the assassination 
of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. If Gandhi is considered the father of the nation's family, Savarkar would be its ostracized, reviled, and hated black sheep. Yet his influence on modern India rivals that of Gandhi's, as evidenced in the rise and growth of the Hindu Nationalist Party, the BJP, and the rather prominent role played even in current Indian politics, played in large part because of the ideology, Hindutva, taken from the title of the text I referred to earlier. It's also the core concept of what has come to be known as Hindu fundamentalism, however misleading the term. And for the very reasons that Savarkar sits awkwardly within a history of Indian history, a stark and unpleasant contrast to Gandhi, to say the least, his life provides us an opportunity to rethink the regional, the national, the imperial, and the international circuits that require our attention if we're to think of new ways to write global intellectual history. Now, global intellectual history presumes that key concepts or ideas travel around the world and that my job as a historian is simply to track and follow that itinerary. So before addressing the question as to whether this is, in fact, the correct way to do global intellectual history, I'm going to set up Savarkar for you in three strands of interlinked historical scholarship. The first is modern Indian history. The second is early modern South Asian literary history, and then regionally Marathi literary history. I'll conclude by suggesting that one way to think about this is to do what Benedict Anderson does in a recent work on the poet anarchist Jose Rizal. And let me begin then. The modern discipline of history writing came into being as a response to almost two centuries of British colonial occupation and its epistemic and representational domination. In a sense, modern Indian history begins as an anti-colonial rebuttal and grows up into a nationalist counterattack. From the mid 18th to the mid 20th century, the large group made up of reformers, political thinkers, philosophers, wrote in new registers as the presence of the East India Company slowly spread its tentacles over much of India, setting the stage for the powerful and pervasive British Raj. Broadly speaking, all intellectuals were nationalists of one kind or another. And so official history in India has always been nationalist history, the history of the nation, and even other historiographical traditions, whether that created by critics of nationalism, like the Subaltern Studies Collective, or the work that comes out of the framework of the global history of ideas from the American modernization world, ideas like Stanley Walpert, Stephen Hay, Ainsley Embry, have also been decisively determined by a nationalist frame of preoccupations. Indian nationalist history has therefore adjudicated both who counts as an intellectual and the ideas that can be considered properly part of the history of the Indian national triumph. Given the stunning success of Gandhi, the long hand of the nation has reached back into the entire period of colonial rule and adjudicated a set of Indian nationalists as worthy of study and those on the wrong side of the nation as worthy of condemnation. Barring a few exceptions, the almost obsessive scholarship that has been trained on figures like Gandhi, Nehru, or Tagore is conspicuously absent in the case of right-wing nationalist figures such as Vinayak Damodar Savarkar who has typically been written about either as the figure who provides us with the starting point from which we draw a straight line to today, or by partisan apologists and eulogizers. By and large, he's written about in ideological terms, either as somebody to be denounced or to be admired. And the corpus of his writings in his own language, Marathi, is rarely read, and nor is the literature on it ever analyzed. Such neglect has produced an unbalanced historiographical account of nationalist politics in modern Indian intellectual history. It has also meant that significant political figures and genealogies of political and intellectual thought are fundamentally misunderstood when they are not altogether ignored. So the very first frame itself, the national frame, requires considerable adjustment, not least given the stunning similarities in the trajectories of figures seen as diametrically opposed. What do I mean by that? Let's take Gandhi and Savarkar. 
Between them, there are striking parallels and similarities, more indeed than between any other nationalist and Gandhi. A right-wing Hindu nationalist and Gandhi are strikingly similar. How? Both traveled much the same road before taking different paths, paths that I might add have had immense importance not just for the nationalist movement, but for defining political options way beyond the basic consensus represented by the emergence of the Nehruvian state in the early years of Indian independence. And now with economic liberalization, Savarkar's legacy is even more important than Gandhi's, despite the official rhetoric. What are these similarities, you might ask? Both Savarkar and Gandhi wrote books in the same year, 1909. Both were banned by the colonial government. Both wrote them while abroad. Both spent close to two decades out of India and in prisons abroad, Gandhi in South Africa, Savarkar in the Andamans Islands. Both took as their hero and mentor the same fiery extremist nationalist, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, both were self-consciously Hindu, and both were secular in their understanding of politics. Even their books were responses to each other. Hind Swaraj was written in part by Gandhi in 1909 as a response to Savarkar. And as I have argued elsewhere, Savarkar's Essentials of Hindutva was the first major salvo in a lifelong struggle with Gandhi. Both were memorialized in biographies while alive. Both resisted that memorialization, and both wrote very peculiar memoirs. If any of you has read Gandhi's Experiments with Truth, it isn't a standard memoir, while attempting to ensure their own role in their posthumous self-fashioning. Even in death, Gandhi and Savarkar are linked. Gandhi bested Savarkar, who expressed a desire very early on in his career to be a martyr for the nation, indeed that desire to be a martyr for the nation stays persistent in all of Savarkar's writings. And yet, on the 30th of January, 1948, a Savarkar acolyte and co-regionalist assassinated Gandhi. And thereafter, Gandhi was the martyred father of the nation, Savarkar his murderer by implication. The two decades following Gandhi's assassination were spent by Savarkar in near isolation until he ended his own life by refusing medication, food, or water, narrated by his Marathi biographers as the taking of Samadhi. So Gandhi, Nehru, Bose, Savarkar, perhaps the four most important nationalists of the colonial period in India. Gandhi and Nehru have completely dominated the literature. Understandably enough, perhaps, Gandhi played a critical role in propelling the nationalist movement, and Nehru became the chief architect of independent India. But even Bose has received more attention than Savarkar, and this is curious. Despite the importance of Bose's Indian National Army for the conduct of World War II, he has left few traces in contemporary India and was far less important a figure than Savarkar for defining the course of Indian nationalist history. It is Savarkar who was linked to Gandhi in the most long-lasting and defining struggle over the fundamental features of nationalism, the relationship between religion and politics, the emergence of territorial imperatives behind the nationalist consensus, the methods for and the historical justifications behind nationalist thought in the colonial world. Given the importance then and now, it is quite remarkable that Savarkar has been neglected by historians, both in India and out of it. So the national frame, needs considerable adjustment. But let's move beyond the political frame of Indian nationalist history and locate him in the larger international milieu of anarchism. The problems do not go away. Even if one can take as axiomatic as a starting point that an idea or a concept travels around the world, tracking the global itinerary of that idea, whether it's revolutionary nationalism, liberalism, secularism, to take some examples, has its own difficulties. Let's take anarchism. As an idea, it traveled around the, around the globe from roughly speaking the middle of the 19th century through the early decades of the 20th. It's invoked anarchism by revolutionary nationalists in Italy, India, Ireland, the Philippines, and Russia, to give you just a few examples. But its historical development in India as a political movement 
did not add up to very much. It never actually ascended to the level of a movement. If at all it acquired any real purchase, it did so outside India by Indian exiles, such as Lala Hardayal. Within India itself, all other movements were rendered subservient to the growing influence of the Indian National Congress. Let's move a little east to the Philippines. As Benedict Anderson's work demonstrates, the canonical anarchist Jose Rizal was perplexed when his novels, El Filibasterismo and Nolimi Tangere, were seen as incendiary, even if today they are recognized as anarchist masterpieces. So perhaps the only location in which the integration of the idea and its materialist history came together into something we might call a movement would be Russia. And yet, anarchism as a term was used widely by colonial officials, by colonial police in fact, to describe and proscribe all forms of anti-nationalism from Ireland to Egypt and to the Philippines. Colonial officials provided much of the language for understanding anti-colonial nationalists. At the same time, many of the ideas that traveled in the modern world did so because they were responses to imperial rule, which had a uniformity across different national styles and experiences, recognizable from locations as various as Pune, Chennai, or Shanghai. Marx or Macaulay were locally received through predominantly anti-imperial lenses. Thus the importance of Lenin, for example, for anti-colonial thinkers and nationalists, and the centrality of Mazzini or Garibaldi for nationalists such as Savarkar. In writing an intellectual and social history then of Hindu nationalism, one can begin with the premise that there was an international circuitry of exchange demonstrated by recognizable similarities between, shall we say, Italian nationalism of the Mazzinian variety and the development of similar ideas in India. But to move forward, to locate global intellectual history, we would need to tackle the standard understanding of Indian extremism as something simply fed by Mazzini. Newer iterations of this argument attribute some agency to the individual writers and translators, and now the argument would read something like this. Savarkar read Mazzini and translated his ideas into a Marathi idiom. But the influence of Mazzini may never be underestimated in the development of revolutionary nationalism. So even in this newer formulation, the large premise remains the same. Ideas originate in Europe, and their globalization can be equated to their indigenization in a local milieu. In such a historical understanding of a figure like Savarkar, local history merely adds color to a universal premise, but it doesn't alter it in any way. Nor does it explain how, in fact, the ideas arrive, gestate, and then grow in India. In asking about a global intellectual history, then, we must confront a hidden assumption about both the place and the origin of all putatively global ideas and the direction in which they travel. Now, the aim of this talk is not to suggest a simple reversal of the flow of information and concepts, but rather to pose the question of the expansion of the frames that I'm talking about, national, international, imperial, regional, in order to move past a straightforward unidirectionality of influence and travel of ideas. We know that Mazzini, for instance, read the Bhagavad Gita, in translation, of course, but it does not therefore mean that the Gita's ethics directly translated his writing of On the Duties of Man and Manifesto for Young Italy. It does mean that such a question continues to be a difficult one to pose within the conventional frames of history writing. Mazzini was undoubtedly central to Savarkar's development as a thinker, but we should not begin our analysis simply by presuming the nature, the character, and the direction of intellectual influence. More interesting, perhaps, is to compare Mazzini and Savarkar, noting the ways in which they were similar, if far from identical, intellectual figures. Both of them, Mazzini and Savarkar, saw themselves as literary figures. Both succeeded much more in the realm of writing than in actual politics. Neither was a systematic thinker. Both were cosmopolitan nationalists, stipulating that the nation should be based more 
on a common political project than simply on ethnicity, religion, culture, or language. And yet, Mazzini saw the potential possibilities of pan-Slavic, Italian, and Hungarian movements united in the individual determination of each unit for its own nation. By contrast, Savarkar was staunchly opposed to the pan-Islamic Khilafat movement in India because it was predicated on the opposition to the territorial integrity of India and began with a religious understanding of territory that undermined Indian political unity. I can keep going. Mazzini's national citizens were an association of people who would be governed by their will, which in turn was tempered by moral law. The moral law in question was not named as such, but was clearly Christian, religious in nature. Savarkar had no moral theory at all. Mazzini himself was a deeply devout and religious man. Savarkar's relationship to Orthodox Hinduism was fraught at best. Unlike Kant, with whom Mazzini's notion of the will as being tempered by an individually determined morality is compared, Mazzini was neither agnostic nor willing to hide his religious devotion. Savarkar thrived on making outrageous claims about Hinduism. Mazzini's interlocutors included some of the most prominent intellectual figures of his time, Proudhon, Marx, John Stuart Mill, and John Morley, Liberal Secretary of State for India. And yet it's the same John Morley who was among the many liberal colonial officials to wonder whether Savarkar and his London group, because of their association with Mazzini, were simply fanatics. Mazzini and Savarkar were theorists of a middle-class nationalism. But whereas Mazzini's anti-Marxism was overtly apparent, Savarkar was simply uninterested in Marxism, as was, for the record, Gandhi. Mazzini wrote in the language of progressivism, in favor of women's education, and was irate that he was seen as reactionary or conservative. Likewise, Savarkar was frustrated all his life that he had been seen as a reactive conservative. An early champion of the abolition of caste, he despised the rituals of orthodox Brahmin Hinduism, spoke approvingly of miscegenation and interregional marriage, wrote enthusiastically in favor of science, modernity, and the military, and women's education. By such a logic, the real conservative Hindu nationalist should be Gandhi, who spoke in the language of faith and religion, approved of the caste system in principle, and had very little time for science and progress. And yet, history decrees the opposite. My point beyond sketching similarities and differences, Savarkar Gandhi, Savarkar Matsini, is not just to highlight the histories of these individuals, but also to show that anarchism or any other great world idea took very different forms in different parts of the world. And it is to pose as a problem the question of how we understand what it is such inter intellectuals want to do and who they thought they were, rather than straight-jacketing their messy historical trajectories into unidirectional determinist or insular culturalist frames. Savarkar and Gandhi, Ambedkar, Nehru, Pule drew inspiration from a canon of influences that extended beyond the standard texts of English or European intellectual history. They developed their own theories and teleologies that were expressly part of universal history, history with a capital H, that simultaneously incorporated a, local, incorporated a local agenda with the desire to participate in a larger conversation. They were hardly derivative thinkers, but they had no problems using sources and ideas from outside their own traditions, both to legitimate and expand their own ideas. They operated neither under the anxiety of influence, nor in a world in which they felt the need to be wholly original, wholly indigenous, or even consistent. They were simultaneously global and Indian, with no sense of contradiction or determination. So you see, to locate Savarkar in the world of this global intellectual history would require us to read him conjuncturally while also expanding that second frame of internationalism. But beyond analyzing texts and authors in local and international circuits, one would also need to recognize that Savarkar and his actions circulated within what I'm calling a subterranean intellectual circle 
of other nationalisms. There were, for instance, interrelations and connections between Egyptian nationalists and Indian extremists that were strong enough to render Savarkar's first major historical work on the 1857 Sepoy Rebellion as the chief source of Indian history for the Egyptian nationalist paper Al Liwa. Following the assassination of Sir Curzon Wiley by one of Savarkar's associates, Madan Lal Dhingra, in London, what traveled in Egypt was the image of an Indian nationalist martyr. Indeed, Dhingra became far more of a nationalist hero in Egypt than he did in the immediate milieu of moderate Indian nationalism back in India. Ibrahim Nasif Alwardani, who was well acquainted with the Dhingra case, shot the Prime Minister Butras Ghali, leading some British officials to focus on his connection to Indian extremism. Vardani, Dhingra, Savarkar were subsequently all viewed as religious fanatics, along with and partly because of the influence of Mazzini. Despite the fact that in the archive, colonial authorities had to concede that they could find no evidence of religious hatred, let alone a defense of religion in the actions of any one of these men. It is in these lateral, rather than horizontal global circuits that one might begin to locate with some precision the genealogical history of how and why a reference to Mazzini, friend of liberal Secretary of State John Morley, would for colonial policemen immediately signal the global threat and presence of fanaticism and curiously enough, anarchism. Now, in confronting the relationship between a figure like Savarkar and the questions surrounding a new global intellectual history, we must keep going. We must further ask how to keep a sense of balance between the recognition, on the one hand, that colonial occupation and international intellectual influences were central to the development, in this case of Indian political thought, with the need to remain attentive to the importance of locality and proximate and indigenous intellectual forces in the shaping of any one of the key figures of Indian intellectual history. Reading the full Marathi corpus of Savarkar, perhaps like reading the voluminous Italian writings of Mazzini, which I have not done, I hasten to add, presents a very different and rather more complicated picture of a man who I have so far characterized by unilateral terms such as nationalist, anarchist, fundamentalist. Savarkar, surprisingly, was much less interested in history as a form of writing than my paper has so far presumed. In many respects, he was far more a literary than a political figure, as I mentioned earlier. In his prose, history was simply equated with ideology in that history, just the bare facts, the past, was used as an instrument as bluntly as possible. In much of his historical writing, whether his first work in 1857 or his last work, The Six Glorious Epochs in Indian History, as he perceived them, the standard elements of historical writing, basic commitments to facts, accuracy, historical causation, and sequence, seem unimportant at best and often absent altogether. They are replaced instead with passion and polemic. Now, there is simply no reason for us, given what we know about his education in both India and in England, to believe that he did not know his dates, or that he was simply stretching a historical fact, or working with an alternate chronology. How then do we explain his fundamental disinterest in history as a discipline? As a discipline, I say, yeah? not as a concept. Perhaps we might need to look elsewhere for a more authentic understanding of his basic theory of, of history. Savarkar fashioned himself primarily as a poet. His first publications were poems, were poems. It was the genre, poetry, to which he turned repeatedly in moments of crisis, and which characterized the core literary motif of his incendiary essay, Essentials of Hindutva, which I've referred to before. His poetry, was ideological as his prose, addressing the political problems of his time, such as child widowhood, the plague, the emasculation of the Hindi Hindus, the need, as he saw it, for an Indic civilizational malaise 
to be enlivened with a hearty dose of modern medicine. And yet, his poetry is profoundly rooted in his sense of his regional literary tradition, the importance of Sanskrit meter, and to the recognition that the genre of the epic courtly poem takes as its subject matter not merely mythological themes, but also political biographies. Savarkar seems to see himself as following in a tradition in which, as, La as Larry McRae has argued in an essay on a Sanskrit poet, Bilhana's Vikram Ankadeva Charita, this is Larry McRae's argument, that the real kingmakers were poets, not historians. And poetry, I quote from McRae, does not simply publicize or preserve the memory of heroism, of royal virtue. Rather, it creates them. Savarkar may more accurately be understood as having fashioned himself not just as yet another Marathi poet, but as a mixture of Matsini and Bilhana, as the exemplary, all-powerful bard who could marshal a classical idiom, fuse it with a local tradition to write into being the modern nation state. Now, Savarkar's poetry varies in its quality. Some of it is good, some terribly pompous, some lyrical, and most of it is difficult and convoluted. This is not unusual as his poetic voice matures and finds its stride. He wrote his poems to be read, to be published in magazines by a new readership that was cognizant, nonetheless, of old literary styles and meters. He used regional Marathi meters. He used classical Sanskrit meters, such as Shardula Vikridit, Mandakranta, and the verses, with some exceptions, scan correctly. The poetry itself can be said to reference his own personal trajectory. He was born in rural Maharashtra in a small town called Bhagur, and then educated in Nashik, a larger town or a city, and then in the city of Pune, an old and colonial large city. His own personal trajectory took him from one of the smallest villages in Western India to progressively larger and more cosmopolitan milieus from Pune to the heart of empire in London. Despite this international travel, local roots and histories remained powerful for him, both in terms of his upbringing, but also in the development of his own historical consciousness. Both the colonial author Grant Duff in his History of the Marathas, written in 1826, and V.K. Rajwade, the eminent historian of Maharashtra, wrote about the region's claim to its own national history from about the 17th century until the final defeat of the region in 1818 by the British East India Company. I mean to note here that the regional historians of Western India wrote of their own history as a national history of its own, which means what? It means that the region's history cannot be easily assimilated into the broad Indian nationalist frame with Gandhi and Nehru as the founding fathers, even as it was, of course, linked to it. The memory of the Maratha chieftain Shivaji Rao Bhosle and his recurrent battles with the last great Mughal emperor Aurangzeb makes up a significant portion of the region's self-identification. The militant poet sage Samarth Ramdas, who was both Shivaji's political and spiritual advisor, in effect becomes the patron saint of a modern Marathi community that memorialized him in several literary and poetic works. If we are then, as historians, to begin to try and peek into Savarkar's library, a difficult task not least because, given the surveillance he was placed under, most of the documents that we have available or we might have had available, were destroyed by the family. We would certainly need to acknowledge that in addition to Matsini and the modern Marathi poets, the influence of pre-modern poets, such as Ramdas and Morapanth, must be taken into account. So I get broader and broader and broader from the national frame to the international frame, to the colonial frame, to the imperial frame, the subterranean frame. I'm now in the pre-modern world of South Asia. Let us take in brief, one of his longer poems on the subject of child widowhood introduced to us through the plague. Savarkar wrote this poem, it's called Bal Vidva Dusthiti Kathan, in the early part of the 20th century, as a fairly young man. Plague in the early 20th century in Western India had devastating effects on the rural countryside and towns and indexed the immense cultural divide 
between well-meaning English colonial attempts to curb and contain it and the manner in which those attempts were seen by the population of the region. Savarkar uses a disaster made worse by colonial policy to lead us to the traditional and older scandal of child widowhood, in which he will excoriate widowers for being able to live on and prosper and remarry at least as much as he will go after a fossilized Shastric law. The poem itself is 102 verses in the Arya meter. I'm not going to recite all of them. I'm just going to give you a brief summary. He changes voices constantly from his own as the poet to that of the plague. The plague has a voice in this poem. To a householder, the ghost of a dead wife dies because of the plague. Her ghost appears in this poem to a young wife and a young widow to whom the entire poem is dedicated. The plague travels all over India, caresses with a very terrible hand. First Bombay, then goes to Pune, to Nasik, traverses the route of sacred pilgrimages, bathes in the Godavari, and goes to Puri. Savarkar's own voice will ask in this poem, what else can I say? The plague circumnavigates the country without tiring, destroys cities, and none of the mantras and chants in Sanskrit had any effect. The fallacy of believing in Sanskrit chants and prayers is emphasized by Savarkar over and over again in this poem. I note here that I'm speaking to you of a figure who is considered the founder of Hindu fundamentalism. From verse 29, Savarkar is relentless in making sure no heartstring, no emotional avenue, no intellectual avenue is left unexplored to let us know the horrors of child widowhood. In subsequent verses, he leaves everyone in ashes. The sacred cows of Orthodox Hinduism are excoriated by him, the Vedas, the lawgivers, the priests. His pen is fierce in its denunciation, in particular of merry widows, widowers, I beg your pardon, who remarry young girls even as they are in their dotage. In that sense, it is an anti-hegemonic text that marshals an ideological critique of a nation that has not yet come into being, and it does so by recourse to a classical idiom. For women, the plague piles particular insult upon injury. It creates child widows who lead miserable lives. It also kills mothers, sisters, wives, coming close to eradicating the female race for India. What does he advocate and who does he turn to? The leader of Orthodox Hindus, the Shankaracharya, in this poem, to lend his support to widow remarriage to the founding of schools for widows that can be run by older widows so that a new society can benefit from generations of educated young women. This is written in the early part of the 20th century. Gandhi is not writing this. Tilak is not writing this. Nehru is not writing this. It's being written by the founder of right-wing extremist, militant, exclusive nationalism. Now, why would this one poem be important, other than the fact that it won him an award and marked him as an early age, as an upcoming poet? In part because the long hand of presentism has disallowed real historical inquiry about key figures like him. The history of nationalism has disallowed a more regionally specific examination of how figures like him feature in the region. More importantly, his poetry was the most intellectually demanding of all of his writings. And it is quite striking that no writer in English on Savarkar has bothered to read it in Marathi. They would not do this with a Tagore. Why did he choose to write in such a Sanskritic idiom that was so convoluted, yet much more attentive to tradition than his historical prose? In other words, much more historical than his historical prose. The tentative answer to this question cannot be found in the literature in the modern period. And so, in order to put global intellectual history in its place, I make my task even more difficult. The answer to that is that it must engage and acknowledge the connections between the kind of writing Savarkar presents and the pre-colonial global world, described by Sheldon Pollock as the worlds of the Persian and Sanskrit cosmopolis. That world, Pollock writes, I quote, may be said to know three international culture languages. Note that Pollock uses the word international for the pre-modern period. Sanskrit, 
the major Indo-Aryan language of pre-modernity with a literary history of two and a half millennia, Persian, whose own history began anew at the start of the second millennium, and from the 18th century on, English. Added to these, I'm still quoting from Pollock, are a small number of middle Indo-Aryan script languages of the first millennium, the Prakrits, above all Maharashtri, and Sharaseni, Pali, and Upper Brahmsha. The new Indo-Aryan languages of the second millennium, including Bangla, Gujarati, Hindi, Sindhi, Sinhala, and Urdu, and four major Dravidian languages of South India, first attested at different points in the first millennium, Tamil, Kannada, Telugu, Malayalam. Savarkar's knowledge and use of Sanskrit, Maharashtri, Upper Brahmsha, and modern Marathi locate him, therefore, as part of a literary culture that has been international in a non-European direction for two millennia through the overlapping Sanskrit and Persian cosmopolis. How am I doing on time, Lauren? Yeah, okay. In a widely cited essay called The Death of Sanskrit, provocatively cited, provocatively titled essay, Sheldon Pollock laments the loss by the late 19th century of Sanskrit as the language and medium in which original thought and conception could be articulated. Identifying four text moments across a large swath of time and across regions in pre-colonial India, Pollock argues that by 1800, the capacity of Sanskrit thought to make history had vanished. As he puts it, the great experiments in moral and aesthetic imagination had entirely disappeared and creativity was confined within the narrow limits of hymnic verse, the hymnal. A little over a hundred years earlier, Vishnu Shastri Chipurunkar, who was the writer and publisher of a magazine called Nibandhamala, had asked the same question for Marathi. Chipurunkar had agitated about the possibility that Marathi the language of Savarkar, was in imminent danger of falling quickly into disuse as an organic and live language. The language of political sovereignty that had taken the Maratha empire to Atak and Delhi, the language of poets Tukaram, Ramdas, Mukteshwar, Vaman Pandit, Morok Panta, was in the period of his time, Chipurunkar's time, in real danger, he thought, of being replaced by those who thought it too beggarly to be used as anything other than a translation language and believed it incapable of used for innovative thought. In passing, Chipurunkar also remarked on the robustness of Marathi in a political context, separating between the language of rule and the language of colonial occupation. The language of rule, Muslim rule, as he called it, required the learning of both Arabic and Persian, both of which had entered Marathi, but had done so without destroying it and had paradoxically strengthened it. This was not the case, Chipurunkar argued, for English. His explanation for why it is the case that English destroyed, whereas Arabic and Persian did not, is quasi-spatial. Persian and Marathi interacted, but didn't appropriate each other's spaces, he argued. But English maintained no such separations and had become a craze. In turning their heads to follow the spread of English, the early 20th century Marathi intelligentsia, he argued, had spun their heads so much that they'd lost their heads altogether. The infatuation with English was made even worse for Chipurunkar because Marathi was only going to serve the servile purpose of rendering English more widespread. By Chipurunkar's logic then, as with Sheldon Pollock's logic about Sanskrit, Marathi too, in its connections with Arabic and Persian, had always been global, even as it had regional connections and traditions that were independently vital and important. Savarkar's poetry, I return to, engages with Chipurunkar's argument and Pollock's argument with a significant departure. Sanskrit is privileged over other languages, but his poetic corpus indexes a moment in Indian history in which the worlds of the folk and classical, the pre-modern Sanskrit cosmopolis, and the deep regional poetic, trad poetic tradition come together with an anti-colonial and nationalist agenda. Now, the curiosity of Savarkar's poetry, about which I will speak at great length tomorrow, so I will move a little fast today, <laughs> 
is that while it is recognizably Marathi, it is so Sanskritized as to be nearly incomprehensible to an average Marathi reader, such as myself. It is neither Marathi nor Sanskrit, but both. It's neither classical nor folk, but deliberately mixed, a form of writing that seems to have been intended to interpolate and irritate both a native Marathi speaker and a Sanskritist equally. Savarkar attempts to ignore the modern divide between the separate linguistic communities of Sanskrit and Marathi, insisting on bringing them together. It's a poetry that both Sanskritists and most Marathi scholars deride. It does not reify either canon overtly, even as it pays both of them respect. It breaks as many rules as possible while letting the rule keepers know that he, Savarkar, knows all the rules. He worships Ramdas, he imitates Moropanth in a secular register, he pays attention to Chiprunkar, whose politics he broadly sympathizes with, except not his assessment of Marathi, and he thumbs his nose at Orientalists, Indologists, and Sanskritists, who then and now read his hybrid Sanskrit as inaccurate Sanskrit and bad politics to boot. How then does one write an intellectual history of a figure like Savarkar? It is clear that while conventional categories are useful in a piecemeal understanding, all of the frames that I've described to you today are inadequate. The Marathi regional frame is inadequate because he was far more than just a Marathi poet. The national frame is inadequate because it ignores altogether the regional density of literary history and nationalists who don't match the Gandhian standard. The modern nationalist frame is inadequate because it takes no account of the continuity between an older Sanskrit and Persian cosmopolis and Savarkar's experimentation. The early modern frame is inadequate because it discounts Savarkar's later hybrid experiments as inelegant and incorrect. In the time that I have left, I will try and pull this all together by referring to Benedict Anderson's recent work on the Filipino poet, Jose Rizal, in his important book entitled Under Three Flags. This is an international and global history in many threes about nationalism under three banners depicted on the cover the anarchist flag, the Cuban flag, the Filipino flag. There are three Filipino patriots to whom Anderson pays attention, Isabello de los Reyes, Mariano Ponce, and Jose Rizal, although the last member of this group interests him more than the others. The three worlds of Bismarck, global anarchism as a phenomenon, and the declining Spanish empire make up for Anderson the larger historical backdrop for the development of these ideas and their circulation. Between symbolism, literary figures, and both Spanish and American imperialism, the frame is set. But Anderson does not attribute to the frame a single explanatory role. Instead, the connections between anti-colonial Spanish nationalism in the Philippines and Cuba are explored primarily through this intense focus on Jose Rizal what he did and did not read, where he might have read it, how his writings might have been interpreted, where his works were circulated, where they were misunderstood. Anderson follows Rizal around the world, reads his books, by which I mean reads what he wrote, but also reads the books he read, opens his suitcase, peers into it, and is struck by the presence of certain authors in his library, Chateaubriand, Voltaire, Zola, Cervantes, Balzac, Swift, among others, and puzzles over the absence of political writing in Jose Rizal's library. No Hegel, no Fichte, no Marx, no Tocqueville. No Comte, no Saint-Simon, Fourier, Bentham, Mill, Bakunin, Kropotkin. Yeah? Despite the fact that Rizal spent 10 years in metropolitan centers such as Madrid, Paris, London, and Berlin. The importance of international radical movements is, of course, central to the development of homegrown nationalism. But Anderson takes local literary production on its own terms, even as the literature reveals an instrumental relationship and deployment of the quote-unquote science of anthropology or the development of folklore. What's most compelling about Anderson's work is that his early version of the determinate, of the determinate spread of nationalism, which we uh, jokingly refer to as fax nationalism, is now much more complicated. <laughs> 
The interesting circuitry of the exchange of ideas is not about overdetermination, let alone easy or straightforward influence, and Anderson repeatedly stays away from the simple or easy answer. As I try to understand Savarkar's relationship to similar circuitries of global, local, imperial, international, colonial ideas and influences, I begin by taking my cue from Anderson's refusal to privilege similarity over difference, answers over questions, and generality over particularity. What do I mean by this? Savarkar's anarchism can certainly be easily affiliated to the international political project of, and I quote, spectacular assassinations committed by despairing and hopeful anarchists, as they were described, and compared to Rizal's despair and pathos, expressed in a letter in 1892 at the young age of 31, with instructions that it be opened after his death. Here's what Rizal wrote in that letter, as quoted in Anderson's book. I quote, I also want to show those who deny patriotism that we know how to die for our duty and for our convictions. What does death matter if one dies for what one loves, for one's country, and those beings whom one reveres? I have always loved my poor country, and I am sure I shall love her to the last moment. My future, my life, my joys. I have sacrificed all for love of her. Some common tropes between Rizal and Savarkar are inescapable the fetishization of martyrdom, the overwhelming sense of duty to a feminized country, the sublimation of all erotic desire into this abstraction. But there are local affiliations too, as I have pointed out, not least Savarkar's debt to and location within a deep Marathi literary tradition. Neither can Savarkar's anarchism be explained in relationship to or reconciled with the figure of the beleaguered Brahmin as the exemplar of heteronomy within an overwhelmingly conservative Hinduism, a persona, the heterodox Brahmin. In the wake of his self-fashioning, Savarkar's Marathi and Hindi biographers recreate for him over and over again. Without recourse to folklore, but with a vague and inchoate autodidacticism, apropos of Sanskrit treatises, Savarkar, in his Essentials of Hindutva, wrote against Gandhi by putting in place the idea of territorial India as an antique land populated with a mytho historical people. Neither Rizal nor Savarkar used the term anarchist as a means of self-identification. Colonial policemen used the term, and now historians do. But the term calls attention both to global forces and meanings and to deep and fundamental contradictions even when the question of influence seems on the face of it undeniable. I have noted the pre-colonial and early colonial global configurations chiefly to point out that there was always a global circuitry of ideas, but also that the centrality of enlightenment categories to Indian intellectual history cannot be separated from colonialism. Colonialism was as much a contingent historical force as it was a provocation both for nationalist resistance and for claims of civilizational autonomy or superiority in opposition to the idea of the European origin of all ideas. It was colonial rule and the epistemological assumptions of colonial, imperial, global history that worked to cement the force of the categories that have long since been under dispute. Tradition modernity, European enlightenment versus colonial enlightenment, the origin of European ideas, the reception by world historians. None of these categories, I emphasize, can by themselves do all the work they need to for a global intellectual history. The study of history, Partha Chatterjee wrote, must concern itself with the ceaseless process by which structures are transformed into events and events are transformed into structures. Historical discourse is constituted on that constantly shifting tension-ridden, inherently polemical terrain of knowledge. This is not an easy task, and Chatterjee prescribes for us the bitter pill that historians must all chew. We need to accept as a theory of history what he called the uneven development of contradictions, a varying order of antagonism, and here's the rub, 
a large zone of theoretical indeterminacy. At the very least, this would require acknowledging the fundamental character of colonial domination, at the same time putting in play the particularistic histories that can be seen for all the figures adduced in this talk, including not just Savarkar and Mazzini, but Rizal and others too. As Anderson's under three flags shows us, there is a first salutary lesson to be learned. If we are to proceed at all with a global intellectual history, the hermeneutic frames have first to be expanded and then resolutely and perhaps permanently left open. It is one thing to acknowledge, as Shudipto Kaviraj did, that the ghost of Europe hovers over us all. It is quite another to argue that the specter of Europe should set the terms of the arguments, or worse, that it has already done so, and we just don't recognize it. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to compliment you on this very, very, you know, powerful presentation. But I have a few questions, you know, I mean, sure. they're interrelated. One is a very basic question from someone who knows very little about this historical trajectory that you have taken. Uh, is, has Savarkar, in any of his writings, lionized Shivaji? Who? Yes. Number one question. Number two, is there any relationship between Bankim Chatterjee, the Bengali writer? Yep. Because he's perceived as one of the founders of extremism right. and Hindu fundamentalism right. in the recent discourses. And the third point is that your parallel between Jose Rizal, and you present him as a poet, not as a nationalist leader of the Philippines. But Jose Rizal, in other cases, you know, has been compared with Gandhi. Mm. Because you know, both of them are nationalist leaders. Sure. And a, a kind of minor point that you know, people who you regard as anarchists one could argue that yeah, anarchism was a choice by necessity, that you're fighting a colonial power, and you are anarchist, you know, it's, it's a kind of temporary appointment as an anarchist, <laughs> but yeah. then you, you know, start building on the nation, right. then you give up on anarchism, and you become a nation builder. How do you reconcile you know, these sort of contradictions? Thank you. Thank you, those are terrific questions. Yes, of course. Um, Savarkar lionized Shivaji. Um, the argument that I'm making in a chapter, I, I should sort of begin by saying that I'm writing a book on Savarkar. And it's a book that I've been writing now for the past seven years, so I think I can't any longer say it's a new project. It's been new for seven years. Um, and one of the difficulties with writing on Savarkar is precisely that people don't read him in Marathi, so I've been making my way through all of his writings in Marathi. Yes, of course, Savarkar not only lionized Shivaji, but I would argue that, in fact, he did much more than lionize Shivaji. What he um, does, particularly in his poetry, and in his, if you know Marathi poetry, um, particularly a powada, uh, Tanajita powada, he, I would say, overlays on the entire history of the 17th century what he does is he transforms that history from, shall we say, a rustic Marathi history, a local, regional, not even Marathi history, perhaps a Deccan history, because that's what the region was in the 17th century, and turns it into a Brahminized history. And so he sort of erases caste contradictions in some very interesting ways. Yes, he lionized Shivaji. He lionized Shivaji, so did Bhargangadhar Tilak, but Savarkar's work on Shivaji actually moves Shivaji out of the region of Maharashtra, Tirak's work retains him in Maharashtra. So that's the first question. Is Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay uh, one of the fathers of extremism? Sure, but not as centrally as um, other figures are. And um, in part, I would say, because Bankim is not read that much outside Bengal. He's read subsequently in translation, certainly his um, Anand Mart is read, but it's, it's the figures that I think you could sort of say were central, and, uh, central extremists, at least in the sort of normative Indian historical tradition, would be Lal Bal Pal. Yes, Lal Lajpat Rai, B.C. Pal, and Bal Gangadhar Tirak. The Rizal Gandhi um, comparison, you're absolutely correct. What I was doing was simply drawing from the way Ben Anderson reads Rizal. Yes? And the 
question about anarchism, I'm not by any means saying anything about the actual tactics used by the nationalists. I'm talking about the language of anarchism that is used by colonial police in the archive for many of the people concerned, where what is suggested is that anarchism is this kind of widespread fanatical movement in India. Yes, and the language of that archive then carries through into the language that historians use or have used to in fact describe very many of the same people. Whereas what you see is that if anarchism comes with a specific ideology, then somebody like Tillock, for instance, will say, look, the anarchists um, who throw a bomb right, um, in Russia or the anarchists who are concerned about the amount of money certain millionaires make are not the anarchists in India. That what Indians are doing is something very, very different. So fairly early on, even within the sort of extremist movement, there is a sense that the language that's being used to describe what they're doing should be freedom fighters, should be anti-colonial nationalists. But anarchism becomes this kind of catch-all phrase for colonial policemen across colonial territories to sort of describe everything that smacks of anti-colonial nationalism. That's what I was gesturing to in this essay. Did I answer your questions? You yes, much. okay. Oh, that's a good question. Well, in my first book, I, um, I hinted at a question that I did not fully answer in the book. And the, and the question that I had in my first book, which I wrote about the development of something called Hindustani classical music. And um, I picked up Hindustani classical music because it wasn't picked up by historians. Music was typically written about by ethnomusicologists or by musicologists. But my sense was that Hindustani classical music played a kind of um, a role in the development of an Indian middle class, a kind of finishing school for the Indian middle class in particular ways that moved one group of women into the limelight, moved another out, took a Muslim performative practice, rendered uh, Muslims incidental performers to their own tradition. And so in the course of writing that book, I wanted to look at uh, the development of the sort of anti-Muslim sentiment in Western India and how that played with the fact that the, the baton seemed to have passed from Muslim performers to Western Indian performers, Maharashtrians. How did that happen in a region in which there are very colloquially expressed anti-Muslim sentiments? I left that question aside in the first book. When I decided to do the second one, I thought I would work with or work on the central figure who is associated with an anti-Muslim exclusive Hindu nationalism in India. And that was seven years ago. I realized that it was a lot more difficult than I did it, not least because in large part, and I refer now back to the first question, in large part because of the lionization of Shivaji, which I will argue Savarkar does perhaps more extensively than anybody else. It is, it's dangerous ground. A colleague of mine who um, said some, made a slight argument against Shivaji generated a firestorm in India in which a very old library was, was destroyed because he was perceived as um, insulting the memory of Shivaji. So wandering down a path in which I'm going to write about something called Hindu fundamentalism is, is something one needs to do carefully. Um, and so it's not only am I being careful about it, but I'm trying to make sure that I read literally everything that I can about him. Seven years because Savarkar's Marathi prose is difficult to read and it is nowhere near as difficult as the poems that he wrote. And the poems that he wrote are particularly difficult and particularly convoluted. And so that's the reason why it's so difficult <laughs> and it's taken me so long. I hope I'm coming to the end of it. I'm very interested as a historian 
uh, you know, the exchange of information and ideas is, is, um, and influence is, is very interesting. How do you see the, uh, looking forward as, as a historian, how do you see the impact of social media uh, changing this dynamic? Oh my, I think I'm gonna have to punt on that question. I think social media, how, I would have to confess to you that I don't use it. I don't, I don't do Facebook or Flitter or, in, or it, Twitter, sorry. So um, I would really have to punt on that question. I'm making my way steadily back to the 18th and the 17th century. So um, come back to me on that. Let me think about that a little bit. Um, obviously, you know, social media suggests that anyone can be a historian. Yeah, anyone can be a commentator on a contemporary or an older event. Um, what the status of that comment is remains to be seen, partly because the internet allows everybody to be anonymous and, shall we say, unmediated. Um, I don't think I can be either anonymous or unmediated in writing my history. So I think that relationship between an unmediated and anonymous comment on a very mediated and very named work will probably need to be worked out in the future. I think the internet and social media has perhaps a greater impact in the dissemination of the popular forms of history about which I will speak tomorrow, which is to say that I think the, the internet, and I'm, I'm, switching, I'm switching your question, I know I'm doing that deliberately, um, I think the dissemination of forms of popular history telling, yeah? in my case, the Powada in particular, um, I think cements or at least lends evidence to the argument that I'm making about this particular figure, which is that he is picked up in the popular world a great deal more than he is, shall we say, in the scholarly world. Um, and that's a very inchoate answer to your question, for which I apologize. <laughs> Thank you.